Hey guys, this is baby Leo. ASMR this video. Just kidding. But I will have to be a little bit softer because Leo is sleeping. Leo, it's your first time saying hi to everyone. Do you want to say hi? Hello. Okay, so for those who are new to my channel, welcome and of course our Musa fam. Hello, it's been a really long time and yes, Jen's back. I am finally kind of out of my postpartum recovery period. I think I just hit six weeks yesterday. So I'm feeling much better lately and so I found the energy and time when Leo's sleeping to film this video about how I gave birth to this little boy. So if you are interested in my birth story, we're gonna start. I'm gonna put Leo back into his room to sleep and I'll catch you guys up basically like my friends on how everything went down. So yeah, if you're interested in finding out the gruesome details, <laughs> just kidding, just keep watching and let's say bye to Leo. Leo. So get your cup of tea or a snack or anything, put your feet up and get ready to catch up with me. Let's begin. Okay, are you guys ready for the tea? Just to quickly catch you guys up, my pre-pregnancy weight was 42 to 43 kilograms and I went up to 60 kilograms. It's crazy, I know. But I've lost um, about 10 Ks right now, so I've just hit the 40s finally. I'm 49 and I still have quite a while to go, but as I said on Instagram, I am currently exclusively breastfeeding, so I'm kind of just taking it slow. I know I need those energy stores, but that's probably why I still have a bit of swelling going on or if I look a little not like like myself just understand I just gave birth <laughs> actually I totally forgot to do this video until one of you guys mentioned it on my Instagram comments but as soon as the thought crossed my mind I wrote down everything I could remember but there's like the beginning period that's kind of foggy to me so I'm just gonna tell you guys what I do remember <sighs> where do I start in general my labor turned out okay it wasn't like too traumatic didn't go according to plan for sure I would say it was still a pretty okay labor experience for me so I really do give thanks to God and I praise God for just being so faithful and helping things to still go smoothly everything worked out really well in the end so to be honest guys I don't know how long my actual labor was because I don't know when to start calculating my labor since I actually started getting contractions like a week or two in advance of the actual day of birth. Throughout my pregnancy, I was keeping myself fit. I had a personal Pilates instructor who is specially trained for preparing pregnant women for labor. So it's really important to keep your physical body just in really good shape, practice breathing. Although the, all the classes were canceled because of coronavirus, I did a lot of online research as well as my Pilates instructor helping me going through breathing techniques and focusing on my core, which really helped a lot. I thought I was really ready. <laughs> so my plan, as you guys probably know, was to go all natural. We'd booked a room in a hospital that focused on natural birthing environment called Chayon Chui in Korean. So they provide a bed for you as well as a bathtub and a bouncy ball and you can just have freedom to use the space if you want. So we had booked that room and I was just going to be flexible. So I didn't know if I was going to end up giving birth on a bed on my back or like sitting up or in the bathtub. But I wanted to use it because I, I read up and I researched a lot about how water birth thing can really help to prevent tearing because it prepares the skin and it can also help to uh, relieve you from the pain of the contractions etc etc so I had that plan I also planned to try my best to do non-medicated so no epidural because I thought that the epidural would interfere and lead to more interventions and I wanted to try my best to not go into the c-section territory unless I had to as an emergency I also thought that epidurals would block me from being able to work with my body's natural motions and contractions that was our plan so yeah sorry about that new camera it just turned off so I had to wait also throughout this video I might have to quickly go and feed Leo and come back I apologize if like the lighting keeps changing in the background okay so it's kind of crazy I really thought that I would remember every detail of this because it's such a huge event in anyone's life I realize that there is like something in built-in women that helps us to kind of forget because it helps us to be open to just have more kids even if it was a very painful experience I think that's what it is because it's been like six weeks for me and I already started to forget 
the feeling of labor even from like a few days after it happened so it's it's just really strange on the 7th of july i remember i woke up from this dream this crazy dream that i had of like this worship leader and like the heavens opened and then like, i had this song ringing in my head this korean worship song that goes it's just a korean like song that i don't know why i had that running through my head as i woke up feeling like my cervix was literally opening i've never felt that before and i thought that okay Leo's coming. <laughs> so I was like telling William, oh, but I've never felt this before. It's like a really different feeling. And up till that point, I had been having Braxton Hicks contractions for the past like two weeks to the point where it was so often that I didn't even notice I was having one. So for those who don't know what Braxton Hicks contractions are, anyone who's new to pregnancy and labor stories, they're basically like practice contractions that your body goes through before actual labor contractions. They are different because they don't have the pain of contractions, but it just feels tense and feel this kind of pressure it's so just a little bit uncomfortable and tight feeling but it kind of helps you to i guess warm up and your body actually is preparing itself some people get them a lot and some people don't get them very often so i actually had them for a really long time before labor so i was like okay i'm getting the hang of this if this is what it's kind of gonna feel like <laughs> but the real labor contractions you can start feeling them when you're feeling like this back pain or like menstrual pain kind of pain associated with the tensing of your uterus. So I hadn't felt that menstrual pain like pain with these contractions until that day. So July 7, I was like, something's happening. And I went into the hospital with Will, found out my cervix had already dilated to 1.5 centimeters. So 7th of the 7th, I don't know when that exactly is, but I think it was like 39th week of my pregnancy. So all throughout pregnancy, we thought that Leo was gonna come early for some reason because he was always like one or two weeks ahead of the average size, head circumference and body size, everything. But nothing ever goes to plan, right? <laughs> so hospital, 1.5 dilated and no, we were just told to go back home, came back home and throughout the week, I did sort of experience stronger contractions constantly, but the real thing didn't happen. So 12th of July, which is like five days later, I started to have like these really strong regular contractions. I, I remember all throughout that week, I had been feeling like this was never gonna happen. I heard that a lot of first time expecting mothers feel this way as well. They feel like, when is it? actually ever happening it really feels like it's not going to happen <laughs> like, i don't know the fact that you don't know exactly when it's coming i think it just kind of feels really surreal and you're just waiting for the day even though you know that there'll be pain associated with it and there'll be kind of a little bit of suffering involved you really just can't wait for baby to come by that time and you're just like come out now <laughs> i want to meet you so we were literally going through that for like one or two weeks and I had this really good doula, by the way, guys. Her name's Ginny, and she's really experienced with natural birthing. One of the most experienced natural birthing doulas in Seoul. She also speaks English and Korean. She was like basically my angel <laughs> on the actual day of birth. I was so, so grateful for her in the end. Okay, so 12th of the 7th, I started to get stronger contractions and they were five minutes apart. My doula had told me the 311 rule, three minutes apart for one hour, then that's when I should head into the hospital. My doctor had told me 511. So anywhere between 311 and 511, I was thinking that would be when it's happening. Five minutes apart is the 511 stage. And I was like, it's happening, it's coming. <laughs> so that morning we headed into the hospital. They were really starting to get very painful. And I was really sure that baby was coming. We went in, apparently I was still only 1.5 centimeters dilated. So I was sent back home. So that day we went back home and I had contractions the whole day and they were starting to get closer and closer together and they got to the point around midnight yeah there was a point when it became three minutes apart for, for about an hour but suddenly it slowed down and went back to like 15 minutes apart so by this time it was like midnight and i was like talking to my friends my friends yj and grace and i was telling them i was going through contractions my friend yj was telling me can you tell me how it feels because she's pregnant right now as well she was like i just want to see you going through a contraction i was telling her that i had prepared myself with the breathing techniques and i was breathing through it by that time it was like it was painful but not to the the point where I was cringing. I, it was to the point where I had to stop, but I just could breathe through them quite easily. But then when it slowed down, William and I 
thought, okay, so it's not today again. We were thinking, should we pack and should we go? That happened for a while. I contacted my doula and she said she could tell that I was not in active labor yet by just hearing my voice. She advised me to just have a really warm bath that would kind of ease the pain. And by this time it was midnight. So it was like the morning of 13th of July. So that's the funny thing. My doula thought that I wasn't ready. You know, by outward signs, it really didn't look like I was that ready. So William helped me to start a bath, but something inside of me felt like it was coming. Like I could just feel that something was happening. Anyway, William helped me to get the bath ready and suddenly I had the urge to go to the bathroom and this is where things like started to go down okay so get ready for a little bit of TMI but without this information it doesn't make sense like I need to tell you this to complete the labor story so I went to the bathroom I had to pee and I was going through a contraction and as I was peeing I think this was God because I don't know where it came from but if this hadn't happened we wouldn't have ended up going I was peeing and I suddenly felt this really intense feeling to push my whole body was like wriggling and I felt this intense feeling to push and the, that the baby was about to come out <laughs> I didn't know why I felt this I kind of yelled out to Oppa and I told him what was happening and I said Oppa I don't know why but I'm feeling like I need to push he was in the other room making the bath for me and he just said let's go until that point we had been like should we go is it time is it not apparently this happens a lot with many first births because you don't know when the time is and everyone's different like there's no one sign for it you could be going through like three minute intervals and really strong contractions but you could be going through that for like days or you could be having a baby within an hour so <laughs> no one really knows what's going to happen i had this urge to push which usually only comes right at the end of labor but that was what caused us to just tuck and go so we left for the hospital and good thing because on the way there in the car the contractions were three minutes apart and they were the most intense contractions that I had so far. I had this app that I was tracking my contractions with. It gives you like a smiley face or like a still face with a grim mouth or like a really sad red face. So you can kind of like rate and track your timing as well as the ratings of the contractions. They were starting to go into the red zone for me. Our car, it was an AMG at the time. We sold it because it's way too bumpy for Leo, but it was so bumpy and it was causing my contractions to happen as well. And I remember I had to literally hold on to the side during my contractions just it was painful it was starting to really get there I couldn't do anything while it was happening and I was just breathing through it but it was still bearable because I was able to breathe through it um, it's um, 3 a.m. in the morning and Jen's having a massive contraction and uh, today's our 13th of July and look at this woman <laughs> she's wearing makeup in between like massive contractions, uh, baby's about to come out and she's doing this. This is how dedicated she is um, to, to the makeup world. So yeah, we are very, very excited. Um, we've been just resting home and uh, uh, it started happening again. So all fingers crossed that uh, the doctor will give us an okay sign to remain at the hospital this time. Yeah, so I will keep you guys posted. So 3 a.m. arrived at the hospital, went to the delivery room area downstairs. You know, I had booked that room, but I was only allowed to go into that room once I was four centimeters dilated. So that's just the basic rule of natural birthing in that hospital. I'm not sure about other countries, but so that was happening. I went in, doctor checked me and I was still only dilated two centimeters. So for those who are new, or just in case there's anyone who's here who knows nothing about dilation, because I really didn't know anything about it either before I got pregnant. Dilation is like how big your cervix opening is. It needs to get to 10 centimeters, which is like <laughs> maybe that big. And it's big enough for baby's head to push out and body to come out of. Kind of crazy, but women's bodies are made to do it and come back to normal again. So don't be too freaked out. I remember first time I saw it, I freaked out. Yeah, you need to get to like four centimeters to usually be admitted and active labor is usually like six centimeters or onwards, but everyone is different. So it can take you days to dilate to 10 centimeters and then have the pushing stage. Or if you have a really short labor, it can happen really quickly, like in an hour. I was praying and hoping that it would be a very, very short one. But at the same time, if you have like too short you can tear badly as well so there's no absolute good or bad um i was stuck at two centimeters and i was going through three minute apart contractions which my doula said that's when you head into the hospital typically three minute apart contractions are when it's happening you're already four centimeters dilated but i was stuck at two centimeters not able to be admitted and they were so painful. By the time I was at the hospital 3 a.m., I was in the labor room downstairs. The doctor was like saying, no, it's not 
intense enough. I was like, are you sure? Because they were monitoring my contractions. And I remember there was a point, a moment when I felt very dismissed because the contractions started to get really bad that my calm breathing was starting to not really work. Like I had to really focus to just breathe through them calmly and not like resort to like a scream. <laughs> and I had practiced this bearing down through really painful positions that my Pilates instructor, who's very hardcore, was putting me through and like she was helping me to focus on breathing through pain. I thought I was ready for it, but it was starting to get really intense and they were not admitting me. It was two centimeters dilated. And I remember one of the nurses, um, she said, when you came earlier this morning, the contractions then were stronger than the ones you're having now. That was really weird for me because no way, like in the morning when I came, I didn't even have to focus on breathing through it. I hardly felt them. They were like, I'm just a little bit mixed with menstrual pain. But now it was to the point that I couldn't even just breathe through them. The thing that was monitoring my contractions, I think it moved off of my belly through that time. So I kind of felt that they weren't really monitoring me carefully. And I felt, what if I was further along but they monitored me wrong and they were dismissing me and they were telling me to go home when it's about to happen soon. I remember thinking, oh, a lot of women who go through the more traumatic birthing experiences and being mistreated by the hospital doctors, there's a lot of stories like that. This would be like a glimpse of what it feels like because I really felt like the nurse was downplaying what I was going through and the pain of what I was going through because obviously it's her job and she sees a lot of people going through this all the time, constantly around the clock um, and she was probably numb to it but I felt like there could have been a little bit more compassion to like support the woman who's going through it or like take me a little bit more seriously. <laughs> anyway, so it was starting to get more intense. William and I were basically just waiting in that room until I dilated till four centimeters so that we could be admitted. This happened for a few hours in the hospital room. They kept checking. I wasn't dilating any further and they were telling me either you have to go home because we don't know when it's going to happen or you can choose to stay but we don't know how long you will stay. So they were kind of recommending us to go home and at that point I couldn't even breathe properly through my contractions, let alone walk to the toilet toilet, or even to the car to go home. And I couldn't even imagine driving home at that point, going through that bumpy and everything. They were three minutes apart, come on, like that's when the hospitals tell you to come in and I was being told to go home. So I was a bit confused. <laughs> this is just my personal experience, guys. So guys, this is not um, the, um, the room that we were gonna go, but Jen is here at um, Labor Warden. So I think this is where um, the baby, the birthing room. But we're just um, just staying here because she's having so much contraction. So she's been admitted to this room. She's doing extremely well. Um, there's a, um, so much contraction, but we are trying to turn every pain into praise. So she is um, in immense pain, but um, she's praising God, we're listening to this. Um, worship song and just want to thank God for every bit of this experience. Later, um, if her dilation becomes a bit more prominent, then we might be um, moving up to the, the main room. If we do so, then I'll show you guys, but otherwise we just have to make the decision um, whether to stay here to go up, depending on the results of um, the cervix exam. All right. Two minutes right now. I haven't entered actively by hand. Still at 270 meters, not by hand. Breathe deep. Breathe deep, Jen. You're doing great. You're doing great. I don't know if anyone else has been through something similar to this, but it lasted for six hours. And in the fifth hour of going through those contractions, they were really, really bad by that time. And my husband called my doula, told her we were in hospital, told her the situation, and she heard me in pain <laughs> in the background. So she decided to come in, even though I wasn't four centimeters yet. As soon as she came in, um, by that time, I had to grip onto the sides of my bed in order to just get through. And like everything else around me was like, during my contractions, I didn't notice anything that was happening around me. I remember the moment that my doula arrived, it was like Superwoman walked in the room. She just came in and she knew exactly what to do. She put down her bag, came straight to me and touched me in the areas like push my back, just coached me and encouraged me and support me, helped me walk to the bathroom at one point, And I really needed that help. So Jen is actually going through um, her labour. Can you 
this, you can do this. Keep breathing. Good, good, good. Now, just like that. So yeah, we decided to stay because there was no way that I was going home. I felt pressured because they were thinking that I wasn't far enough along and the pain was so intense guys. I don't want to scare anyone from Eleva but I'm smiling right now but I really do remember that to be very honest with you guys, I was in between contractions and there was a point when I felt the contraction coming again and as it was starting, I felt like I was in an unending nightmare. I felt like I was in hell almost. <laughs> I. I'm really sorry to say this. I don't really remember it either, but I remember thinking that at the time. And there was a point when I actually thought, this is something I don't really remember like the pain of as well. But I remember thinking during one of the contractions, why did I do this? Why did I ever want to be pregnant? Why did I ever want a baby? How have women gone through this? How have all these people come into birth with women having gone through this? And I think it was the thought that I had eight centimeters left to go and that obviously I would have to go through much stronger pain towards the end and of course have to push at the end. They were so intense. I really felt like I would die if I go through to 10 centimeters uh, and I have to have the strength to push baby out as well. William and I, in between contractions, we were thinking and we were discussing and talking about epidural, whether I should get an epidural or not. Uh, throughout my entire pregnancy, I had really prepared for a natural birth, really do my best not to have to resort to medication. And I'd done so much research about it. I was like so adamant that I'm gonna do water bath <laughs> and everything. I really held out as much as I could for six hours, seven hours, and then there was a point when I, uh, William says he remembers me saying make it stop through one of the contractions and towards the end I wasn't breathing. I was, I was holding on to the rails for dear life and I was like sometimes I let go and I was kind of screaming through them or like struggling through them even though my doula was helping me and I remember thinking how can I possibly go through any more pain than this how am I going to make it through this as soon as one of the contractions ended I remember saying to Oppa, Ba. I'm gonna get the epidural. I think I need to get the epidural. And he was like, are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. I wanted it to happen so fast. There's no shame in getting an epidural, but that was just my choice for my labor because I really didn't want to go into the further interventions, which statistically it can lead to, you know, oxytocin, pitocin, and then a baby perhaps like losing heartbeat or contractions slowing down. So things aren't going on. There's so many stories that I read about that and then leading to C-section emergency. Also, I read about how it can affect baby, make them drowsy for the first month. And so um, it can also lead to failure of breastfeeding, which I also wanted to do. So this continued on until 9 a.m. and I had two minute apart contractions for a few hours. Very, very painful to put it into words. <laughs> the worst pain that I've ever felt in my life. Um, I really don't want to scare anyone off of labor or of having babies. It's so worth it. You can probably hear Leo right now, right? <laughs> He's crying for milk. So cute. <laughs> so worth it but oh my gosh i do not ever want to go through that ever again i felt like i was dying i felt like someone was taking my insides out and like ripping them and squeezing them apart and like just trying to kill me from inside <laughs> that's how it felt for me and i have a pretty strong taint pain tolerance like between me and oppa we always said that i have a really high pain tolerance even compared to him but I don't know, everyone's different. Some people have like a really smooth sailing and then they just have to push. <laughs> For me, it just happened to be that they were like incredibly painful and I had still not even left the first stage of labor. So the contractions were ex excruciating, I wrote down. I was still only 2.5 centimeters dilated. I broke down a few times mid contraction and I couldn't imagine how I would get through to 10 centimeters at this rate or how much more painful it would get. William said, I said, make it stop. <laughs> so the only option was that I go home because I still was not dilated. I have to feed Leo and I'll be back. So I'm sorry if there's a bit of a disjoint there, but yes, I'll be back. Where was I guys? Okay, so there was this one particular memory that like really stuck with me from this though. I remember I really needed to pee in between my contractions and you know there's a bit of time in between. So I had two minutes. I couldn't walk but my doula helped me. She put her arm, my arm around her and she helped me walk to the bathroom which was so hard to walk to. I don't know. I've never had such a long walk in my life before. Um, and I was just in the mode of 
hurry. I was like almost panicking. I needed to go in there and come out quickly. It must have been really painful for me to be thinking this now that I think back because I just remember thinking the last thing I want in this world right now is for me to be in that bathroom and going through a contraction with no one around me and just stuck in there by myself doing contraction. I wanted to get out ASAP. I could feel it coming and I wasn't done yet. And as soon as I opened the door, my doula was waiting there. This panic just came across me and I said to her, what do I do? What do I do? Otokeo uh, in Korean. Otokeo, otokeo. And she just took my arms and put them around her shoulders, held me and hugged me as I went through that contraction, like standing up together. She just like didn't even have to say anything. And that hug just meant so much to me. And I just felt like it was like, my mom was there. I remember when I was telling this story again to like one of my friends, like in the first week or two after birth when the hormones are there and you're kind of actually feeling depressed. I was tearing up when I was telling this story because it meant so much to me. If you have been keeping up with us, you guys probably know that our family are all overseas and I literally don't have anyone here. Like my mom is in Australia, my mother-in-law is in New Zealand. She happened to just move like just before coronavirus happened. And so everyone's just like stuck in their places. I do have relatives in Korea, cousins and aunties, but I didn't feel comfortable enough to like ask for help or anything. I haven't spent much time with them in my life. So they're not like immediate family. So yeah, all throughout my pregnancy, I actually felt quite alone. I felt like I didn't have like a community and I didn't have the village, so to speak, to talk to about things or anything. So I think going through labor and then knowing that baby was coming and having to take care of baby all on our own as first time parents was also kind of like this scary thought at the back of my head. And I was kind of depressed about it, although I was looking forward to it as well. So anyway, having this doula who was like my mom there and she just like knew what to do. I was so, so grateful for her. As I finished that contraction, we walked straight into my room again. I made it through, William was there and I remember the next contraction started immediately. You know, usually husbands don't really know exactly how to help, whether they should help or whether they should pull out and that's where doulas really come in handy. They actually help your partner to help them help you in the best way possible. So I was really grateful for this as well. He actually told William to hold me through that next contraction and I sort of like fell onto him and he hugged me through that next contraction too. So this was all before I got the epidural. Got the epidural administered at 9.30 and there's all these risks involved with epidural as well. You could have back pain for life, you could have like skin itchiness that goes on for a long time. So I was you know just trusting God through it but it was a big needle. Normally I would be a little bit nervous about it, even a little bit, but at that time I was thinking please give me this epidural. <laughs> They actually asked Oppa to go out of the room quite a few times. That's one of the things that I was a bit sad about because I've watched a lot of birth videos. The husband is like always really there, and, you know, very involved, and like hugging you through it. But that didn't happen. And I think it's because this is Korea. I'm not sure. But a lot of times when anything was happening, they actually told him to leave the room. So he had to like wait outside a lot. And he was just like kind of distant in my memory for me, even though he was doing a lot of things in the background. Of course, most of the times it's actually better that the husband doesn't really touch you towards the end anyway because you just need to have that space and be in that primal mode. So anyway, I'm loving but I'm talking as if I'm catching my friends up with my birth story anyway. So you guys don't mind, right? Um, so yeah, Oppa had to leave the room and the, all these nurses just like came in kind of emergency like. I think at that time they kind of realized that I'm actually in active labor even though I'm not dilated much. It was probably a rare case, I'm not sure. They started to kind of take it kind of seriously. <laughs> I had to get into this position where I'm kind of like really crouched down, lying on my side and my head is against my knee as much as possible. The nurse told me that you'll probably have to go through a few contractions while you're in this position and you have have to stay still. I remember thinking like how the heck am I going to go through a crazy intense excruciating contraction while I'm getting stabbed by a needle in my back. Somehow I just did it with the thought that this is going to end soon. I got it administered. I somehow grunted through going through contractions whilst having a huge thing stabbed into my spine. It actually took quite a while to put in. I think it took about half an hour for the whole process. They have to like put it in, take it out, put it in and take it out and put it in a few different positions down the spine. But I was just really trusting God and I was thinking one of these contractions 
will be my last one. Again, I don't want to scare any of you guys off of pregnancy or having a baby because everyone's story is so different and you probably will not have such crazy contractions as I did until at least maybe just like the last few moments before you have to push, not stuck at 2.5 centimeters, which is like right at the beginning of labor process. So don't worry. And even if you do, I got through it, you will too. So please don't let this scare you off having babies because babies are so beautiful and so precious and like nothing compared to the labor process. Okay, so anyway, I entered the heaven of epidural land. They had this word for it in Korean. I remember one of the nurses asked me, have you entered epidural heaven? <laughs> I remember asking my doula because she's like so experienced with natural birthing. She also does home births. If I keep saying this, I'm not gonna have her for if I have a second baby because she's gonna be so booked out. But yes, Jenny putting it in for you. <laughs> but I thought she would actually advise me against epidural, but I think she thought it was also probably fitting for me to get it as well. And she's seen many different labors. She said some people have a harder time in the beginning and it's like a lot easier during the pushing process. Some people have a really easy beginning and then at the end, the pushing is much harder. For me, obviously it was the beginning part. The cervix thinning was just very excruciating and intense for me. So anyway, I had the epidural done. I dilated until four centimeters by 10 30 a.m and they finally admitted us into our own room i was very grateful for that because i liked having that space whereas the other room that i was in people were just coming in and out and william didn't have a proper place to sit and that was like at the back of my head i felt really bad to him it was very clinical whereas the other room that we had booked it was like actual double bed and it felt like a bedroom there was a bathroom it was private and it was calm and it didn't feel like a hospital it just felt like my own space Having the benefit of being in a hospital just in case there's any emergency, there can be procedures done straight away. That's the reason why we chose to go for this. Um, and we went to Cha Hospital for those who are wondering in Gangnam. I actually highly recommend that hospital for if you're interested in natural birthing because the team is just amazing and my doctor which also, if I mention her, I feel like I might not be able to book her in if I ever have a second baby. She's already very, very popular. And I see why, because she's such a nice lady. She's like a mom. <laughs> she's really friendly. She listens to you. She knows what you want. She's very knowledgeable, very supportive of all natural methods. And she's really experienced and just the whole package. So. We went to the room, everything started to slow down a little bit. My doula said, have a nap. So we had a little bit of a nap, but we still labored through for a few hours until then. And I had dilated to, let's see, William told me, because I don't specifically remember the dilation, but by noon, I was at 4.5 to 5 in dilation. And by 2 p.m., I was 5.5 dilated. And at 2.15, a nurse came in, and I'm very grateful for this. A nurse came in and Jeannie was like, this is my favorite, she's amazing. So meet her. She came in because Jeannie has worked with Cha Hospital so much and many other hospitals. She was familiar with a lot of the stuff and she was telling me that she's my favorite. Basically, this nurse did her magic. She helped me to dilate from 5.5 to 8 by 3 p.m. So what she did was, this is kind of like graphic, but those who are into birth, this is like nothing. <laughs> if you're into babies and stuff. She basically stretched me out with her fingers so that I would dilate. And she came in later and helped me during the pushing process as well. And I think I can give her a lot of the credit for me not tearing at all because she helped to stretch me slowly. Um, and that's one thing that I would actually recommend to you guys when you're looking into your birth hospital or birth team um, or even just knowing what to request at your birth. Um, it's really helpful to have someone to physically like manually help stretch you out gently so that it wouldn't just happen so quickly that you tear or have to resort to just an episiotomy, which is the cutting. Okay, I remember actually at lunchtime, I was not gonna eat anything because just in case you do a C-section, you're not meant to have food inside of you. My doula said it's fine. So I had like a few bites of, you know, those triangle kimbap. Oppa brought a few of them and some drinks for us from the 7-Eleven and I just took a few bites of it. I wasn't really thinking of food, but I felt like I just needed to store the energy up for the pushing. So just in case I, I put something inside of me, but I wasn't really thinking about food at all. And actually this is a really interesting part, but they didn't really let William 
be around. The room had like two sections. If I have footage or photos, I'll put it in this video, but there was a sliding door. So he was able to sort of like lie down on the sofa. But in Korea, a lot of the times they actually tell the husband to leave. And I heard from him later that he felt kind of really in the way, almost like people were annoyed at him for being around. So he just kind of exited the space until he was called. So he didn't watch at all. Just in case you guys are wondering, this is actually a decision that you have to make when that time comes, whether you want your husband to see everything or not see it. And that's for another video if you guys want. <laughs> the reasons why they might, you know, have to decide that. So by 3.20, I was fully dilated. And by that time, it had already been like six hours since I had my epidural, but the baby was still really deep inside. My doctor came in and she said, you only have like an hour left until your epidural is gonna wear off. So we have to hurry. So I got to work. I remember just determining in my heart and my mind and I had this like faith that it's gonna work out. And I knew that I had prepared my body with Pilates, breathing, pushing. I knew I could do it. So I determined myself and I pushed with all I could. But yeah, the contractions were not strong enough. So they had kind of weakened. The doctor was worried. I only had a little bit of time left. So she suggested that I get an oxytocin drip in very small doses. Oxytocin is like the love hormone, which you can get from physical touch with your husband, with your baby or anything. And it helps to strengthen contractions and get things going again. So we decided to go ahead with that. We trusted her and it helped kind of the contractions to increase again. So from there, I gathered all of my concentration, all of my strength. It's almost like the feeling of the urge to poo. It really does feel like the urge to poo. And the surprising thing is, you know, I told you guys earlier in the video that I was worried that the epidural would actually just fully paralyze me. So I can't feel when to push and know when to work with my body. And literally I'll just have to leave it all into the hands of nurses who would tell me when to push, which could go adversely. The funny thing is epidural works differently on every person as well. Apparently some people, it doesn't really work at all. Some people have it working on half the side of their body, <laughs> which is like you're defeating the purpose because you're still feeling it on half the side and you can't even move into the different positions that you would like to. Actually, it did kind of paralyze me to the point that I couldn't feel the pain, but I could still feel the contractions and the pressure. So I knew exactly when to push, but just without the pain. And I did with all my strength, push. <laughs> I remember they were kind of concerned because it wasn't strong enough and the baby wasn't coming out. So I actually suggested, and I'm so glad that I did this and I really want to recommend to anyone out there who are future mums to do this as well. Know what you want. And I know my body and I knew that lying on my back, which is the position I was in with my legs up, was not doing it for me. Basically I asked, um, can I lie on my side? I'd like to try a different position. They kind of left me for a while and I did it myself and I felt like this is it because I could feel the urge much stronger in that position. But when you're by yourself, it just works a lot better as well because you're listening to your body. And they came back to fully attend to me and they realized that I had really progressed well and they were very surprised. It helped immensely and baby started to really come down. So yes, guys, I totally, totally 100% advocate and recommend you guys to trust your body and don't be afraid to ask for what you want or just push for it. Because at the end of the day, it's your birth. And if possible, try and make sure that you have an environment that allows you to do that. Okay, so so 3.40, Leo's head started to crown. The exciting bit is, is I actually reached down and felt his head and it was like so shinky. It was soft and I could feel his hair. And, and as soon as his head started to crown, it happened so quickly, in my memory anyway. Apparently it was a few minutes. My doula told me, stop pushing now. And she told me to do the whoo, kind of just relaxing breathing, which is going, through the contractions. So I really was like, okay, I've got this down pat. I've been practicing this for like nine months. <laughs> Baby's head came out super quickly. The nurse who helped me to dilate from five centimeters to eight centimeters earlier was there massaging all the way through and making sure that baby came out well. And I felt this immense pressure, even though epidural, I did feel it was quite painful, but it was still nothing compared to the crazy contractions. So I was just happy. His head came out and his whole body just slid out after that. The shoulder bit, I remember because it's like wider, it did feel more intense, but after the shoulders are out, baby just slides out very quickly. So he was out at 4.17 p.m. 
Hehe. <laughs> when I was pushing, I also was aware that I'm pushing in the right area because if you push just like without thinking, just like, yeah, I just gotta push, you might push the wrong muscle. And especially if you have epidural, you can wake up and realize that you injured somewhere. My tailbone actually does hurt a lot still now when I sit down and stuff, but only for a moment, but I still have pain there. I'm not sure if it's from pushing or when baby comes out, my bone actually stretched there, which is quite common. But yeah, it is really important that you focus your pushing in the right area and that's where I put my mental focus and I use my stomach abdominal muscles to push so it's really important that you keep your core really strengthened throughout your pregnancy as much as possible so the amazing thing is I had no tearing down there and my doctor who has done like thousands of births over the years later she told me did you know that it's pretty much one percent of people that have no tearing after giving birth to a baby that's not even on the small side he's kind of on the bigger side so I was like wow it's amazing yes I'm really grateful to the nurse who was helping stretch me out but apparently even with that you can tear so I think maybe my perennial massages helped and also definitely it was God because I prayed and my mom also prayed husband also prayed so I'm just really grateful but I did have some abrasions so I did get some stitches but it was like really minor so it wasn't too bad I still couldn't sleep properly afterwards for a while but it's okay it wasn't like tearing and I didn't have to get cut also if you get episiotomy compared to a natural tear if you think about like a piece of paper i'm just trying to tell you asap because william's waiting to eat dinner but if you get a piece of paper and you cut it you know the tear is like so abrupt and clean that it's actually hard to glue it back together the fibers are just like fully like cut off but if you get a piece of paper and you tear it naturally like this there's like natural like a zigzag kind of pattern it's easier for it to come back together and the healing is a lot more natural and doesn't leave any damage in the long term compared to the risk of still some kind of scarring or maybe some pain at the site if you've gotten an actual cut. So as much as possible, try to go for natural tearing rather than episiotomy. But that's just from my research. So don't take this as a be all end all. I'm just trying to like tell you guys like you're my friends, the things that I've researched. Anyway, so I'm all healed now, six weeks postpartum. Not like fully, fully, but I'm almost there, like 90 something percent. The center came out with no pain. I remember my doctor, like if you see this video, which I'll show you guys here, the doctor in the background, I have no memory of her saying this because I was like so enamored with Leo. But when I watched the video back later, she's like asking me, Peanapoyo, Peanapoyo, asking me if my stomach hurts. I was like, no, no. <laughs> Epidural helped to cover that, I guess, but. The center coming out can be quite a painful thing later. You might have to get it pushed out physically. But came out, I remember her telling me, reach out and touch the umbilical cord. And I touched it and she was like, can you feel the throbbing? It was like throbbing with blood. Of course, we did delayed cord cutting, which helps the baby to receive all the blood that they can before they cut it. And William cut the cord, which was pretty cool, but I didn't really watch it because I was just looking at Leo. <laughs> so I don't remember seeing that at all. He was crying a lot at first. He was not happy being pulled out of my comfortable little sack of water. Oh, I forgot to mention water breaking. I think the doctor had to break my water. It didn't break beforehand. So I didn't actually experience the gush of water myself. Um, I didn't poo for another TMI. <laughs> That's one thing, <laughs> if you were curious. Um, so they wrapped him in a towel. And one thing I do regret is we didn't do skin on skin. I was just like so focused on him. I, at the time, I didn't think of saying, hey, I'd like to do skin on skin with him, but you can still do it when they're a baby. So I kind of do it with him now if I can. Look up skin on skin and how important it is for the beginning stage. But I remember like he was just lying on me like this. And after he initially cried, he opened his eyes and he looked up at me and started using his hands to touch my face which was like amazing i didn't know that newborns can use their hands to touch things on their first moments of life that was like so special and all my pregnancy i thought that i would definitely cry at the end of a, like a crazy labor everyone has different reactions to their baby william and i were both just like smiling happy and just talking to him straight away hi leo and like we were just talking to him and it was just a really nice like happy moment.
they cleaned things up and they left us to have time with him in the room. My doula helped me to get him to latch and he latched on pretty much immediately and he read from my breast, both breasts, and we had some time together before we had to leave the room. So guys, after 12 hours of intense labor, um, Jen gave birth to our beloved baby Leo. Jen, how are you feeling? Yeah? You did really, really well today. By the way, yeah, Leo's just down there. He's a handsome little man. And um, you can hear him. <laughs> he latched on really well. Yeah, yeah, this room has been a blessing. All the medical staff here at Cha Hospital, they have been so awesome. Yeah, and um, we thank God for this wonderful experience. And Jen and Leo are both very, very healthy. This is it. <laughs> We're parents. I've done my job. I've run the race. I've recorded the whole thing. Well done. A, a little pat on my back. So cute. Over and out. So happy to share this moment with you guys. Bye bye guys. See you later. Bye. Basically, he was born, he came out, we took some photos, we spent some time together alone and his meconium came out, his first poo, which was like a massive green thing, like dark green. <laughs> because of my epidural, I couldn't walk straight away, so unfortunately I couldn't go and see it, but William got to see it, the first poo. <laughs> okay, because of coronavirus though, this is the sad part, like husband couldn't be with me, so I was alone in the hospital. And not just that, rooming in wasn't possible, even though I really wanted to do the rooming in because the beginning is just so important for bonding, for breastfeeding, everything. But because of my epidural, I couldn't even walk. No one's allowed in the room with you because of coronavirus protocol. And obviously because no one could take care of me or baby, I just didn't feel prepared to room him in by myself. Like I couldn't walk, I was bleeding. You bleed very heavily in the beginning, like, no one tells you about this. And I'm gonna do a video all about things that people do not tell you about for pregnancy and about labor and like post labor as well in the future. So please stay tuned. I definitely feel like there needs to be videos about this. When I do put that up, I'll make sure that I link it here or there. It's been so long since I've done YouTube, I don't even know which side it is. They only give us two options, either fully room in, no help, or fully put into the nursery and you only get to visit for five minutes once the next day. <laughs> so that was like the sad part. I really missed my baby when I came out and I remember the night that I was in the empty dark room and I had all those postpartum hormones. It's real, like you actually get quite depressed afterwards for some reason, like I cried about everything. <laughs> I was looking down at my stomach, it was empty and looking down and the stomach that had housed Leo for nine months, it was like suddenly so empty. And of course you guys saw how massive my stomach was. I had a lot of like marks, I still do. and. It was still pretty big, like I still looked about seven months pregnant and it was still contracting because the womb continues to contract so that it goes back down to its normal size. So it was still kind of painful and there was like, it was lumpy and obviously very different from my pre-pregnancy stomach with no marks and like flat. <laughs> and now it's like this pouch, wrinkly, saggy, dark, but to me it just like looked so beautiful and I spent like quite a lot of time praying and th even thanking my stomach. I remember <laughs> I was like crying. <laughs> I was like, thank you for housing my baby. And really, I can't really explain how I was feeling, but I was just crying and thanking God. And I didn't mind how my stomach looked because it was like a reminder of him still with me, even though he's gone. So yeah, I will do another video about like postpartum if you would like to know about that, because I think I need to do it, dedicate separately. And if you have any questions about it, please leave me in the comment below so that I can actually answer them in the next video about after labor. It's like the fourth trimester and it really deserves its own thing. <laughs> no one really talks about it and you only find out about things if you research specifically online and you have to like read everything separately but I would like to do a video to kind of like people let you guys know to be more prepared I guess because I really wasn't as well. And I have friends who are now pregnant and um, I just want to be like the one that sends them information and um, be prepared for. So the same thing that I'm doing to my friends, I would like to share it with you guys if it helps you in any way or even just to catch up with me. But yes, now Leo is out. I hope I didn't miss out on any details or any important stuff. I definitely felt like 
immediately bonded with Leo and I was really grateful for everything that happened in my labor story, including like the sudden crazy random urge to push when I went to the bathroom, which caused me to go into the hospital earlier than later, which might have been very hard, if not impossible during my contraction. I'm grateful that I ended up doing the epidural because part of me kind of feels like, you know, some people actually do die during childbirth and I feel like maybe I might not have made it. I'm not sure. Like it was incredibly painful and I was already in active labor contractions when I was just 2.5. I was grateful for my doula. I was grateful for Uppa just being so supportive in the way that he could be a nurse that helped stretch me out. My doctor who was so experienced and recommended me to go on the oxytocin drip. I'm grateful for my Pilates instructor who trained me, prepared me through my pregnancy, which I think is really, really important. Physically, as well as mentally, you know, at the end of the day, as long as mother and baby are healthy, I think that's just the most beautiful thing. And everyone will have a different and very unique, but beautiful story. So my channel has always been about beauty stuff, but obviously now I have a baby, I'm gonna have some other things to talk about. And I'd like to know if you are interested and along the journey with me. So I'd love to know your reactions to this video. Please don't forget to thumbs up, but also your comments down below. If you have any questions about pregnancy period, postpartum, healing, my body, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. If you have any questions about Leo, <laughs> we haven't decided to what extent we're going to expose him online, but we're thinking of you guys as our digital friends around the world. It's literally just because I want to share my life with you guys and I feel like hiding him from you guys will be hiding a part of my friendship with him like my life is being hidden from you guys and that's just not who I am so in the end I did end up putting some photos of him on Instagram even though that pregnancy was always like at the back of my mind will I actually put up a photo of him or will I keep him hidden but um we're so happy with Leo and it's been an amazing six weeks he's grown so much it's crazy. Please stay updated with me on my social media. And also if you have any birth stories of your own, share with us in the comments below your own stories as well, because everyone would benefit from just reading other people's stories or like things that you recommend for other people who are preparing for having a baby. It's really late right now. William is waiting to have dinner and Leo is waiting for me as well. So I'm just gonna cut this here, but I hope you guys enjoyed this video and finding out about my birth story. I'm pretty sure I will definitely regret not mentioning some things, but that's what I can do for today. Stay safe and healthy and stay beautiful inside and out. I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye. Kamito bye.